Hi students, let's go over solutions and solubility. This is our notes, which is a part two, a continuation from part one before. Let's get started. Here's the essential question you should write at the top of your page. How do we predict if a precipitate will form between a mixture of two solutions? So we've talked a little bit about solubility before. Solubility is the ability of a substance to dissolve. And a substance can either be soluble or insoluble. Soluble means that it is able to be dissolved in water. And insoluble means that it doesn't dissolve or it forms a precipitate. Now precipitate is an important word. It's another name to name a solid. So we've also went over a few state symbols that could be shown next to chemical compounds inside chemical formulas. If it's able to be dissolved in water, we say it's soluble and we use the little symbol AQ, meaning aqueous. If it forms a precipitate or a solid, we put a little S, meaning solid, and that means it's insoluble. Liquid, which is usually water, is L, and then if it's a gas, it's G. So let's review what happens when we take two different substances and we dissolve them in water and mix them. So here's two different substances. This is what they would look like in their atomic forms. Notice again, these are pure substance compounds in their solid forms. If we dissolve them in beakers of water, then their substances split apart and they become aqueous. Now what we're focusing on today is this reaction. When these two substances react, sometimes they can form these things, this, this little gloppy stuff. This is a precipitate. And so taking a look closely, we have this solid substance, this precipitate that forms because these substances come together and they react and they form an insoluble precipitate. Now there are also pieces over here that don't that still stay dissolved. The other two particles still stay dissolved and they are the soluble forms of that. So how do we know when this happens in a chemical reaction? Well we use this chart here which is called solubility rules and this is found inside your periodic table. And so if you look at the back of the periodic table which will be provided to you on the tests and the practices then you'll see this chart. And it really works like this. The left hand side is kind of like the if-then rules. We start up here. If we see these substances then this is what is going to form, probably something that is soluble. And so remember, soluble, if it's soluble, it's aqueous. Now there are some exceptions. If these things are attached to any of these exceptions over here, then it becomes the opposite. It actually becomes insoluble. And so if it's these, then it's soluble. Unless these are attached to it, then it's insoluble. And then the opposite is down here. If you see these things, they're insoluble, meaning that they're forming a precipitate. Unless it's attached to one of these things over here, then it's completely opposite, then it is in then it is soluble or aqueous. So here are a few practices over here on the left hand side. Let's start with this first one, KNO3. Well, notice that all of these things in my if statement over here in my in my rules are all negatively charged. So I'm going to look at the negatively charged thing. That's this nitrate. So I'm going to go over here and I see this nitrate means that this substance is soluble. Now, before I just say that it is soluble, I'm going to see if there's any exceptions. And I see that there's no exceptions. It doesn't matter what nitrate is attached to. This nitrate is attached to potassium. But according to the rules, it doesn't matter. Anything attached to nitrate is always going to be soluble or AQ. All right, let's look at our second example. Again, I'm going to look at the second or negative substance in this compound, chlorine. And I'm going to come over here and I see, oh, here's chlorine. Again, this should be a soluble substance. But before I jump to that conclusion, I want to see what chlorine's attached to. Chlorine's attached to this silver. So I come over here and I looked and I see, oh, it looks like silver is an exception. So if silver is attached to chlorine, then it's not aqueous. It becomes in, it becomes insoluble, becomes a precipitate or a solid. All right, let's do the third and the fourth example. This might be a good time to pause the video and see if you can figure them out yourself. All right, I'm going to go through them and see if you check your answers. So here is our sulfur, and sulfur is down here. It's insoluble, my negatively charged piece. And I see that sulfur is attached to calcium. So I'm going to look at this long list over here. Oh, it looks like calcium is part of this list, which means that it flips. And it's one of the exceptions, and it's aqueous. The last one I see, I'm going to look for carbonate. So I see carbonate is insoluble. And I come over here, and I don't see calcium attached to carbonate. So this one is a precipitate, or it's solid. 
All right, so this, where we're really gonna apply this is after a reaction. So we talked about these things called double replacement reactions, where we take these two particles at the very beginning and we flip them, we mix them. Remember, these are two mixtures we are mixing together and we're gonna see whether their products become soluble or insoluble. Now, if one of them is insoluble, then this is a reaction. But if both of them are soluble, then no reaction occurs. So let's take a look. So first, in order to do this double replacement reaction, I need to know the charges of each of my pieces. Lead here is a positive two charge because it's attached to nitrate, which is a minus one, and there are two of them. Potassium, if I look on the periodic table, is a positive one, and iodine is a negative one. So knowing these charges, I can be able to double replace these things. I can cause them to switch their partners. Now, lead being a positive two, is gonna switch over and it's gonna to attach to iodine if I cause these two mixtures to mix. And so I have a positive two and a negative one. So how many of each would I need to go together? Well, I know I'm gonna need only one lead, but I'm gonna need two iodines in order for this new partnership to occur. All right, next I have potassium, which is a positive one. It's my metal, metals always go first. And nitrate is a negative one and it's gonna go after that. And so if I have a positive one and a negative one, how many do I need? Well, I only need one of each of those, one potassium and one nitrate. All right, so this is are my two products of a reaction between these two mixtures. Now remember, this reaction is not balanced. Again, you'll notice that there's only one lead that I began with, but two leads, or two, sorry, one iodine over here when I begin with, but two iodines over here in the products when I finish. So this reaction is not balanced, but at least I know what the products are, and we'll talk about balancing at a later date. Now I want to figure out whether these two products are soluble or insoluble using my solubility rules. This is kind of the main point of these notes. So I take a look here and I see iodine is my negatively charged piece. And I'm going to go find that in my, in my rules. So I see here iodine is negatively charged. So this should be soluble, or I should put an AQ here. But I'm going to go over and look at my exceptions. I see lead is in here, and lead is attached to iodine. So what that does is it makes it insoluble. This is a solid little chunky piece. Now let's look at my other product, potassium nitrate. So I'm going to find nitrate. Nitrate is soluble and there's no exception, so that is aqueous. So this does form a reaction. It does form a precipitate. I would see a little solid chunk form from this in this reaction. All right, here's a practice yourself. Pause this video right now and see if you can figure out the answer. Did you pause the video? Let's go ahead and try this out. All right, remember this is a double replacement reaction. We are going to take these two products in the beginning, two reactants in the beginning, and we're going to mix them up. So lead is going to go with hydroxide and sodium is going to go with sulfur. And so if I follow the charges, remember charges are important. These are what the two products are going to look like. Remember lead in this instance is a positive two charge, hydroxide's a minus one. So we need two hydroxides here. Sodium is a plus one and sulfur is a minus two. So I need two sodiums in order to counteract the charge. Again, this reaction is not balanced, but we're not going to worry about that. We're just showing the products and we're canceling the charge. All right, based on solubility rules, hydroxide is insoluble and iron is not an exception. So it's an insoluble product. So this one does form a little chunky solid. It becomes out of the, in a precipitate. All right, sodium and sulf sulfide, if I look sulfur's down here, and sodium is one of the exceptions. It's right here, so this one is aqueous. All right, that's the end of the notes. Take a moment to follow these things, and good luck.